Welcome back everyone to another reaction video. Well, I've had a number of suggestions that I check out the channel, The Fat Electrician. Uh, so I've decided to go ahead and do that today and I was browsing through looking at his video topics and I saw this one and I felt it was something I might be able to add a little bit to because uh, it's a topic I'm somewhat familiar with. A lot of his stuff is about uh, more modern military history and stuff like that, or about weapons that I don't know a lot about. But I uh, was just at the Bellowood Wood Battlefield again a couple weeks ago, making some uh, content that I'll be showing upcoming here in the next few months, probably in the spring sometime. Um, and I'll tell you more why about the timing on that later on, but uh, it has to do with Project X. But anyway, I thought we'd take a look at his story of the most gangster Marine of all time, Dan Daly. I want to give a shout out to my cousin Rita, uh, who is one of my besties, and she uh, she signed up as a patron. So thank you, Rita. I really appreciate your support uh, and your friendship and your family ship uh, over all these years. So uh, the link is in the description to the original content, so you can check out not only this video but his entire channel without my commentary. Let's go ahead and dive into the most gangster Marine of all time, Dan Daly. Go ahead and make your prediction now. Who would win in a fight? 200 Kung Fu practitioners with melee weapons or one Marine with a machine gun? Today we're talking about the most gangster Marine ever. A man so remarkable that General Lejeune himself would declare him to be the most outstanding Marine of all time. A man that was so fierce on the battlefield that General Smedley D. Butler, one of only two Marines to ever receive the Medal of Honor, twice would declare him to be the fightingest marine he ever knew ladies and gentlemen and why did he say that about dan daly because dan daly was the other marine to receive the medal of honor twice and he should have gotten it three times except I, I, i'm getting way ahead of myself i'll let him talk the only other marine to receive there the medal go. of honor twice Sergeant Major Dan Daly. Born in New York on November 11th, 1873, Dan Daly would grow up competing as an amateur boxer as well as working as a paperboy. And while working as a paperboy might seem like the useless details you throw in at the beginning to humanize the main character, in this case, it's anything but, because him working as a paperboy would create a butterfly effect through time that would change the U.S. military as a whole. You see, you gotta remember that this is the late 1800s and information and news didn't spread the same way it does today, so working as a paperboy back then meant that he always got the newspaper, meaning that he had more information at his fingertips than 99% of the population. Because of this, he would be able to closely follow the exploits of future President Theodore Roosevelt and his famous Rough Riders all throughout the Spanish-American War. And this would go on to be his inspiration to join the U.S. Marine Corps, hoping that he too would be able to fight in the Spanish-American War. So that's exactly what he. So was you have to remember that at this point, the U.S. Marine Corps is not the force that has the the lore and the mystique and the kind of just you know today when you think of the Marines, you know people think of the Marines and they're like, yeah, the Marines, those are among the best, right? I mean, the re Marines are kind of an afterthought in a lot of ways in American military history at this point. Uh, in fact, when we get to Bellow Wood, which is going to be a big part of Dan Daly's story later on, after he's already gotten the Medal of Honor twice, that's where the Marines are going to really start to make a name for themselves. And on the first day at the Battle of Bellow Wood, they're going to lose more men than they've lost in their entire hundred plus years of history to that point. We do on January 10th, 1899, when Dan Daly would enlist in the United States Marine Corps at the age of 16 years old, coming in at only five foot six and 135 pounds. But hey, as the old adage goes, it's not about the size of the dog in the fight, it's about the size of the fight in the dog. You see, the real problem here wasn't his stature, but the fact that he joined a fight in the Spanish-American War, and the Spanish-American War ended on December 10th, 1898 exactly one month prior to his enlistment date but the news hadn't spread that far yet so he ships off to training anyways so fast forward he finishes up training realizing the spanish-american war is over he's kind of like meh i mean the spanish got off lucky can't help it i mean let's face it i'm gonna get the action i'm looking for at some point right this is america we've been a country for like 124 ish years at this point we've been not in armed conflict for all of like 45 seconds at this point surely something's gonna pop up I don't know if I agree with that, though. I mean, right, so we have, let's go back through history. You've got the, the revolution until 1783. I mean, really fighting pretty much ends in 1782. The war officially ends in 1783. Um, armed conflict with other nations. I mean, I guess if we're going to start talking about, like, fighting with Native Americans, but with other actual nations... Uh, you've got the War of 1812. You had the, you know, the, the Barbary pi pirate thing for a little while there, but that was pretty minor. Uh, you get the War of 1812, and then you've got 30 years until the Mexican War. 
Um, again, little things here and there on the plane and stuff like that. But 30 years to the Mexican War. Then you have the American Civil War. Then you have the Plains Indians Wars. Um, big chunks. But people do forget that in that time period between the Spanish-American War in 1898 and when the U.S. enters the uh, First World War in 1917, we are involved in some kind of Monroe Doctrine-y type stuff. We also have the Philippine Insurrection. Uh, you've got the Civil War in Mexico and the incursions that we do down there because of Pancho Villa. Uh, you've got stuff going on uh, in the Caribbean. Up soon. So he ends up getting put on ship duty over Boxer in the Asian Rebellion fleet on the USS Newark. And sure enough, like after a month of being there, the Boxer Rebellion breaks out. And guess whose ship is the closest one to be able to respond? Dan Daly. All right, real quick, oversimplified explanation of what the Boxer Rebellion is in case you have absolutely no idea. At this point in time, China had really just been opened up to the rest of the world and foreign influence is just flooding in. You have Western businesses going in there trying to make money. You've got Western governments going in there being like, hey, you guys want some democracy? And then you had missionaries going in there also trying to spread Christianity. And all of this influence came so fast, so quick that a large portion of the Chinese population felt that it was too much, too soon, and they started to push back and started a nationalist movement. Pretty Part accurate. of this nationalist movement was a bunch of young men that practiced Kung Fu. Now, to somebody from the West, Kung Fu looks an awful lot like shadow boxing, so they just referred to these young men as boxers, hence the term Boxer Rebellion. These boxers got together, started their own little club called the Society of the Righteous and Harmonious Fist, and then proceeded to run around beating the shit Holy cow, amazing name though, right? The Society of the Harmonious and Righteous Fist. I mean, that's an epic name for an organization. ...out of and or killing every foreign diplomat, businessman, yeah. and missionary they could find. And it is at that point that the Marines get sent in. So Private Daly and the rest of the Marines show up to Peking, China, which would later go on to become known as Beijing, the capital of China, at which point they promptly and immediately take over a large legation center on the southern border wall of the city known as the Tartar Wall. They then so this is really all about protecting American interests, right? They're not really looking to start a war between the U.S. and China, which it very quickly could have devolved into. Uh, this is really about just protecting American citizens, protecting American interests, and there's a lot of American interest in the area at this time. Gather up all the refugees they can find, get them inside the legation center, and set up a defensive perimeter. Things are going well, now we're just waiting for reinforcements. Problem, hours and hours go by, the reinforcements don't show up, and it's about to be dark out. So at this point, the Marine leadership's thinking like, hey, the reinforcements are definitely on the way, they wouldn't just leave us here, which means the reinforcements have gotten lost, because I mean, let's face it, if there was ever a time or a place where the directions of go to the giant building on the big fucking wall wasn't specific enough, it would be in China, right? I mean, they're known for their big ass walls. It's kind of their thing. So they're lost out there. We need to go find them before nighttime. Otherwise, they're going to get ambushed by like a thousand of these Kung Fu guys and they're all going to get killed. So we're all going to leave, go find the reinforcements and come back. Private Daily, you're going to stand guard here by yourself. Now, I don't know what the logic was behind this. I don't know if it was like, fuck Private Daly, he's the new guy, he can have the shitty job, or if it was like, hey, Private Daly's a new guy, this mission's really dangerous, let's leave him here where it's safe, or maybe they knew he was the main character and that he had plot armor, I have no idea. Either way, Private Daly is now effectively playing goalie for America for all of these refugees. So sure enough, like an hour after all the other Marines leave, hundreds of boxer rebels show up and they're looking for a fight. Now, a couple of them have guns like muskets and stuff, really outdated weaponry. By and large, they're all carrying traditional Chinese martial arts weapons like swords, bow staffs, what have you. Some of them are even just rocking the old meat mittens, but they're looking for a fight either way. And this He really doesn't stop to take his breath very often, does he? I mean, I give him credit. He's he's flying along with this and he's very well spoken and and he's able to kind of string it all together. So I'm impressed with his ability to speak, but he doesn't slow down much. I've been like looking for places to stop and and interject and things like that, but I he doesn't really take a breath for me to do that. This is shaping up to be one of the most ridiculous battles of all time. I mean, this is the type of stuff you get drunk at the bar and ask your buddy like, hey, you think you could take on all 300 Spartans if you had a machine gun? Like, that's exactly what's about to go on here. I mean, in one corner, you've got an 18-year-old Marine with a machine gun, and in the other corner, you have 200 martial artists with, like, bow staffs and shit. You literally have gun fu versus kung fu, okay? And here's the kicker with the entire thing. The Society of the Righteous and Harmonious Fist legitimately and wholeheartedly believes that their martial arts training has made them impervious to bullets. Yeah. Indiana Jones, classic scene. 
So this entire horde of kung fu fighters just starts running at Daly as fast as they can as he opens fire with his machine gun and they fight well into the night. The rest of the marines were a couple miles away, they found the reinforcements, but now it's too dark for them to travel in this rioting city at night safely, so they've adopted a little defensive position and they're just holding position until daylight. They're so here's what's crazy about this whole thing is that he gets the Medal of Honor for this and typically the citations for the Medal of Honor uh, at least by the time you get to the First World War, are pretty specific in describing, giving you a real image of what happened. In Dan Daly's case, it doesn't really say anything about this Medal of Honor he got as a private with the Marines in China. It just says for conspicuous gallantry or like, you know, for meritorious service. Like it's like it's like a couple of word sentence for his Medal of Honor. That's all it says. So it really leaves most of it to the imagination. Literally forced to just sit there and listen to the machine gun fire and the yelling and the screaming and machine gun fire, machine gun fire. And then suddenly the machine gun runs out of ammo and then there's bolt action rifle fire, bolt action rifle fire. He gets the machine gun reloaded. There's more machine gun fire. And this goes on for hours. And then it progressively just gets slower and there's less machine gun fire and less screaming and less machine gun fire and less screaming. And then suddenly it just stops. At this point, the Marines have to accept the fact that their friend has just died courageously in battle, fighting an entire mob by himself because they left him alone, and all the civilians that they've been tasked with protecting are going to be slaughtered. And now all they can do is sit there and wait for the sun to come up. So the sun comes up and the Marines start making their way back to the legation center, but they're kind of dragging their feet because, well, they know what they're going to find. They're really just there to recover the remains of Private Daly and make sure that those are taken care of. And they start making their way there, and as they get closer, they're like, Man, D Private Daly really took out a lot of these guys. That's impressive. And they get closer and like, holy shit, he took out a ton of these guys. This is the most aerodynamic mass grave I've ever seen. And they get to the top of the wall and there's Private Daly smoking his pipe, leaning up against his machine gun. And they're like, holy shit, you made it. And he's like, yeah, why wouldn't I? Well, we heard the machine gun stop firing and we just assumed he ran out of people killed. to kill. He's like, no, 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 no. I only quit firing because they quit coming. Dan Daly has effectively pulled off the impossible. He has single-handedly defeated 200 rebels by himself, saving all of the civilians as well as saving the day. All the so probably why there's no real detail about the citation is because nobody was there besides him to see what happened. He didn't have any superior that was nearby, apparently, to describe it. And so they could only say, well, we see the result of this, so good for you. Marines are like, holy shit, we're going to nominate this guy for the Medal of Honor because this is incredible. All the businessmen and the delegates are like, oh my God, we've seen what one Marine can do. And now we've got 1200 Marines. We're definitely going to make it out of this alive. Hooray. And all the missionaries are like, oh my God, this is not what we meant when we said we wanted to make these people more holy. Shortly after this, Dan Daly would be awarded his first Medal of Honor for the battle, and then he would go on to continue serving in the Marine Corps as if nothing had happened. Okay, fast forward 15 years, now Gunnery Sergeant Daly has been involved in every military conflict the U.S. has for the past two decades. He is one of the most experienced combat veterans in the entire U.S. military, and he is a living legend in the Marine Corps. And on October 24th of 1915, Gunnery Sergeant Daly would find himself leading a platoon of men through Haiti during during the Cacos Rebellion. Just after his entire company would cross a river, his entire company would be attacked on all three sides by over 400 Cacos rebels, forcing them to retreat back into the river. And while doing so, the horse carrying the crew served machine gun would be shot and sink to the bottom of the river. So you're talking about a company, so depending on how big the company was at this point, it could have been anywhere from like 80 to 150 guys. So regardless, they're outnumbered a good probably three, four to one uh, in this battle, but again, uh, probably superior weapons, superior tactics, superior training. As the remaining Marines continued to cross the river before adopting a defensive position to repel the attack until nightfall. It is now pitch black outside and Gunnery Sergeant Daly knows as soon as the sun comes up, they are going to get attacked again. And the only chance they have is to get that machine gun back from the bottom of the river. Mm. So he takes off by himself in the dark of night goes all the way back to the river and just begins diving to the bottom of the river, trying to find this dead horse with the machine gun strapped to it. And after Jeez. hours of trying, he finally finds this horse, manages to go down, untie the machine gun, come back up for air, I didn't go know back that. down again, getting pieces, ammunition, the gun itself, the tripod. He gathers up all of this stuff, gets it out of the river, and then straps it to his back and carries it back to his men. Bear in mind, that is over 200 pounds of equipment, and this guy is 5'6", 135 pounds, but he gets it done anyway. He was 5'6", 135 pounds when he enlisted. He may not have been that now that he's in his 30s. 
ways. Now, Marines believe in a couple things when it comes to a gunfight. Number one, bring a gun. Number two, bring friends with guns. Number three, decide to be aggressive enough quickly enough. If you're not picking up what I'm putting down, I'm trying to tell you that he is not about to use this machine gun for self-defense. He's about to use this machine gun for self-offense. First thing in the morning, he gets his men together. They launch an attack first. The the standard doctrine of the day, uh, and we've talked about this before in relation to World War One, which is going on at this point in Europe and in Africa uh, and in other places, too, uh, is that offense is the best defense. It's the cult of the offensive. It's the idea that you always want to take the initiative whenever possible scattering the enemy into the jungle, retreating, and Daly has effectively saved himself and all of his men, earning himself his second Medal of Honor. Fast forward two years, June 1st, 1917, World War I, and Daly is now a first sergeant, leading an entire platoon of young, inexperienced Marines into the Battle of Bella Wood. If you don't know the Battle of Bella Wood, the Germans are just rampaging through France, making a beeline right towards Paris. And at Bella Wood, the US Army, the Marine Corps, the French Army, and the British Army all get together to stop the German military in their tracks. Now so this is part of uh, a couple of things that are happening in 1918. Uh, the Russians are out of the war. They've signed the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk and they're out of the war. Uh, so the Germans rush 50 or so divisions from the Eastern Front over to the West and they're gonna launch this major spring offensive before the Americans can arrive in large enough numbers to turn the tide of the war and seal Germany's fate. And so they launch this uh, series of offensives, uh, sometimes called the Ludendorff Offensive or the Kaiserschlacht Offensive or the Spring Offensive. It's really several offensives. And this is part of the larger, what's called the Second Battle of the Marne. They're getting within 35, 40 miles of Paris. They're trying to drive a wedge between the British and the French, drive the British out of the war, get the French to the negotiating table. And as the Americans are starting to arrive, uh, while General Pershing, the American commander, wants the U.S. to have its own sector of the battlefield, of the front, which it will get eventually at saint Mihel and then at Meuse-Argonne. At this point in the war, what Ferdinand Foch, the uh, French uh, general who's all Allied Commander-in-Chief, what he needs more than anything is just to be able to plug the Americans wherever they can. And so Pershing agrees to this. And so this division, I think it's the second division, is made up of both Army and Marines. Uh, and they are plugged in at the Second Battle of the Marne near this town called Chateau Thierry, and they end up going into combat at Belleau Wood. Now, this made it not only a strategic battlefield, but a symbolic battlefield, because how dare you stop the mighty German military? Now they're going to hit back twice as hard just to prove that it was a fluke. Because of this, right after they stopped the German military on June 1st, the French military is like, okay, we stopped them. Let's take the W and head back to Paris and yep. we'll fight from there. We don't want to get slaughtered in this wood line by the Germans because they're pissed. And it is at this point that the Marine leadership famously responded by saying, and I quote, Retreat. Retreat? Hell. Hell, we, we just, just got, got here. here. And then that uh, was actually a Marine, uh, I think he was a captain or a major named Williams, uh, who apparently said that to uh, a French officer who informed him as the Americans were arriving that they were withdrawing. They weren't re retreating all the way back to Paris, but they were withdrawing from that part of the field. And the Americans had their typical swagger and kind of come in thinking they can do whatever. And they're going to launch a bunch of frontal assaults through this wheat field outside of Bellow Wood that's going to go disastrously for the Americans. And the Marine Corps pretty much dons their gas masks, fixes bayonets, and proceeds to fight their ass off for the next 26 days straight. Okay, here's what I need you to understand. On paper, the Marine Corps should absolutely not win this fight. They are both outnumbered and outclassed. The German military is one of the most veteran fighting militaries on the planet at this point. They are, but they've been fighting for four years. They're not as veteran as they used to be because they've taken millions of casualties. Uh, they've been launching this spring offensive. Many of these guys have come from the Eastern Front where they were fighting for years. They're exhausted. They're depleted. Uh, they are short on supply uh, and food, especially after years of blockade. They're not the German fighting force of 1914, 1915. And it's not just the Marines, it's the Army as well. 
point in time, and the Marine Corps is primarily comprised of a bunch of 18-year-old kids that have never seen combat. True. However, leading those 18-year-old kids is a bunch of fucking badasses like Dan Daly. Okay, this video started with him being a paperboy from New York. He is now a 45-year-old man with two medals of honor that has been in the Marine Corps since he was 16 years old. This man is a grizzled veteran that has been there, done that, and has a t-shirt, and he is about to don his plot armor and fuck shit up. So the Battle of Bellawood kicks off on June 1st, pretty much immediately First Sergeant Daly's lieutenant gets shot and he is now out of the fight, okay? Okay, if you don't know what that- Did he say he's been in the Marine Corps for 30 years? I think he means 20, maybe. Um, actually, yeah, I mean, because if he was 16, he should only be 36 now. I need to look this up. Okay. He enlisted in the Marines at the age of 25, not at 16. I knew there was something that just was not sitting right in the timeline for me with this. If he was 46. All right, so he was he was actually, yeah, in his mid-20s when he joins the Marine Corps. That means the officer is the one guy on the battlefield that sort of kind of pretends like he gives a fuck, and he is now gone. The regulator is off the war machine, and First Sergeant Dan Daly is now in charge of his entire company, unopposed. Fast forward, June 5th, German artillery strikes the ammunition depot, lighting everything on fire. Dan Daly leads his entire platoon in, sets the fire out, prevents all the ammunition from exploding, saves the entire battle. Fast forward five days, June 10th, the German machine gun squad would try to advance on Daly's company. Daly would get up by himself with nothing but three frag grenades and his Colt 1911, using the three grenades to disable the machine gun before approaching, shooting their commanding officer, killing him, and taking the other 14 Germans as prisoners of war. Fast forward a couple of hours, still June 10th, Dan Daly looks around at the faces of the young men that he's leading through this battle, and they're looking tired. They're looking like this is the worst time of their life, and it is at this point that Dan Daly decides that he needs to get aggressive enough quickly enough. This battle's effectively been a stalemate for the last 10 days, and he's had enough of this bullshit, so he gets up, walks right out into the open in this wheat field that's functioning as no man's land between the Marines and the Germans. He looks at the Germans' line, turns around, looks at his Marines, and yells, Come on, you sons of bitches, do you want to live forever before charging at the German line? All now, let's talk about this quote, because it, it is definitely one of my all-time favorite quotes from the First World War. But where did it come from, and what did Dan Daly say about it? So, the first time that this quote appears in print anywhere is in a 1918 uh, history that is written about this battle of Bellow Wood. Maybe it was 1919. Uh, but it describes it as coming from a gunnery sergeant in the... Let me get it right here. So the guy who wrote it was attached to the 5th Marines, and he said it was a gunnery sergeant in the 5th Marines who said it. Uh, but Dan Daly was a 1st sergeant in the 6th Marines. And in doing research, historians have said they've never actually found anybody who, who actually says they heard Dan Daly say that. Uh, now... For his part, Dan Daly, years later, was asked about it, and he did admit to saying something along those lines, but it wasn't the way it was quoted. It was like for, I'm not going to repeat it because I'm a Christian and it's not something we say, but um, he says something and then the, the do you want to live forever part, he did say, but the beginning of it was slightly different. Um, so... There's some, like like all great things in these stories, there's question about what really happened. It's just like the whole Devil Dogs thing, right? The The Marine lore says that they got the name Devil Dogs at Bellow Wood. Hogwash. It appeared in print in April of that year, months before they fought at Bellow Wood. Uh, and it appeared in an American newspaper. So Americans gave themselves that name. It wasn't given to them by the Germans at Bellow Wood. But it's a cool story. So of his marines that's dan fucking daily we're gonna follow him so they charge too in an act of pure hyper aggression dan daly's company would catch the germans off guard and would actually manage to punch through their line causing all the other marines to become hyper aggressive and attack as well effectively setting off a chain reaction that would lead to the marine corps pushing the germans all the way out of bella wood over the course of the next 16 days where on june 26 american high command would receive a single telegram and i quote woods now marine corps entirely giving america its first win in c-o-r-p-s i quote woods now marine c-o-r-p-s core but that that is true about that and uh I believe to this day the Marines are known in French as the Bois de Marine Corps. Like uh, 
they're they're known Corps as the entirely. Marine Corps. Giving Woods. America its first win in World War One and the Marine Corps its new moniker. Due to the blatant hyper aggression of the Marines, the Germans began calling them the Teufelhunden or the Devil Dogs. And Not true. Sorry, I really wish it was true. Sorry, Marines. Marines, you guys are amazing. You didn't get the name at Bellow Wood. I'm sorry. And it's all because of the actions of First Sergeant Dan Daly. After the Battle of Bellow Wood, Daly would continue Listen, to Listen, I enjoy this guy's presentation style, but uh, I just got to disagree with him on this. Yes, what Dan Daly did was super important and it inspired his men and it may have helped with that attack, but they didn't win the Battle of Bellow Wood because, Dan da because of Dan Daly by himself. There were a lot of other people involved in that battle. ...served throughout World War I until on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918, the Germans would surrender, effectively ending World War I, which is why in America we celebrate Veterans Day on November 11th, which is also, by sheer coincidence, I'm sure... Dan Daly's birthday. The guy's the main character. I don't know what to tell you. So then, because Dan Daly was like the badass at the Battle of Bellawood, he gets put up for yet another yep. Medal of Honor, potentially becoming the first man in American history to pull off the Medal of Honor hat trick, getting the three-peat. Should Absolutely have. Absolutely everybody that was there that day all signs off on it. His men, his chain of command, they do the paperwork, they send it off to DC to get this man his medal. Then the political side is like, no, absolutely not. We don't care if he earned it or not. It's not about getting what you deserve. It's about doing what we think is fair. And we don't think it's fair that he should get three medals of honor. So we're just not going to give it to him because we said so. Go fuck. Ba basically, the quote was something along the lines of no living Marine should have three medals of honor which is ridiculous because the guy absolutely deserved it. He ends up getting the Distinguished Service Cross, the Silver Star, and the Navy Cross for the Battle of Bellow Wood. Fuck yourself. So instead, they go ahead and they give him the Distinguished Service Cross and the Navy Cross, which, if you don't know, both of those are, like, tied for the second highest military And Silver honor, Star. Because apparently second plus second equals first, I guess. Anyways, so he gets those instead. And then, bear in mind, this is 1919, right after World War One. Like a month later in 1919, the military creates a new law that you're only allowed to earn one Medal of Honor. Okay, Dan Daly is so fucking gangster, they literally had to change the rules on how many times you're allowed to achieve the highest honor in the military. After That's not actually true. I think he's confusing something here. What was happening in World War I was that you had people who were getting two medals of honor for the same action. Uh, they would get like a Navy Medal of Honor and an Army Medal of Honor, like if you were in the Marines. Like there's a guy, um, Whedon Osborne at Bellow Wood, who I think might have been given both. And so I think they were trying to clarify that. Let me look that up to be sure. Okay, so kind of true, kind of not. So basically... What that did was that meant that they wouldn't give you an actual medal for subsequent actions. You would get a device for it. So, for example, if you see people that get a purple heart or, I mean, like, say, a silver star, and then they get, like, a, um, like a, a star on it or a bar or something to indicate, like, a second one, um, you know, if you get multiples of the same thing, that can absolutely happen. So people can get the Silver Star twice or you can get the Medal of Honor twice. It's just you wouldn't be given a second actual Medal of Honor. You'd be given some kind of a device to indicate you had gotten a second one. Uh, but that actually has been repealed anyway, so that's not even a law anymore. I believe it was repealed, repealed about 10 years ago. After World War One, he would retire as a sergeant major, having turned down becoming a commission officer on multiple occasions, citing that he would rather be an outstanding sergeant than just another officer. He would then go on to work as a bank security guard, where for 17 years he would be the living embodiment of the world's shittiest lottery ticket for anybody dumb enough to try to rob that bank. Could you imagine just being some bank robber trying to get some quick cash and you run into the most gangster Marine of all time? Okay, I'm just going to throw it out there. He didn't retire from being a bank security guard until 1936, and John Dillinger's bank robbing spree was from 1933 to 1934. So for a couple of years there, there was a significantly greater than 0% chance that the world almost got the ultimate clash of the bank robbing gangster and the most gangster Marine. That would have been kind of awesome. And I'm going to go ahead and write that down in my book as the coolest thing to never actually happen. In conclusion, Mark Twain is frequently accredited with the famous quote, it's not about the size of the dog in the fight, but the size of the fight in the dog. When in reality, it wasn't Mark Twain that said that first. It was actually Dwight D. Eisenhower, 
five-star army general and the 34th president of the United States. Somebody that would have known good and well who Sergeant Major Dan Daly was. And I think that maybe, just maybe, he had that five foot six, 135 pound devil dog on his mind when he came up with that quote. Thank you for watching. Best way to support the channel is go buy some merch at thefatelectrician.com. Quack bang. All right, so that was interesting. Uh, I, I like his presentation style. Um, he's obviously not family friendly, so Apologies for not giving you a warning about that ahead of time for those of you who are concerned with such things. But I enjoyed it. Uh, gave us something to talk about. Definitely an interesting character, Dan Daly. Uh, and I'll have more to say about him in my video from Bellow Wood that you'll be seeing sometime in the spring. So let me know your thoughts. Use the comment section below. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching.